My wife Monica is a wonderful person. I love her madly, the more precisely. He loved. I spent eight years with her. There were ups and downs, but we were always together, always close and supported each other. And that's worth a lot. I thought everything was fine with us, but unfortunately, I had to deal with my wife's infidelity. It's terrible how she betrayed me and what she ended up with. Now I'll tell you. It came as a complete surprise. I returned home after a long day at work, expecting to see Monica in the kitchen cooking dinner. She usually returned home at four cog and I arrived around six ties. We had a routine. We shared our day, watched TV, and then went to bed, where we made love most of the nights. I was shocked when I entered the apartment. Monica was sitting on the couch holding hands with David William, a lawyer for a large company where Monica worked as a secretary. Before I could even wonder what was going on, Monica asked me to sit down. She and David broke the unexpected news that they had fallen in love, and she intended to divorce me in order to marry David. David, who handled the paperwork, said I only needed to sign them, and they were only looking for Monica's personal belongings. In a fit of rage, I attacked her. My right foot grazed David's crotch, causing him to drop the papers and double over in pain. I then punched him in the jaw, leaving him lying on the floor in agony. While I was yelling at him, Monica sat in stunned silence. After dragging Monica into the bedroom, she begged me to let her go, but I tied her up and gagged her. Back in the living room, I took control of the situation by tying David up and silencing him. Standing there, I couldn't help laughing at the absurdity of the situation, a husband watching his unfaithful wife and her lover tied up in bed. While they were trying to free themselves, I took my things out of the dresser and closet, packing them into my truck. I took a picture of the couple on my mobile phone, highlighting the bizarre nature of the scene. Before I left, I took all of Monica's money and credit cards from her purse. Taking a last look into the bedroom, I announced that as soon as I got to the city limits, I would call someone to help them. I was debating whether to call sooner or later, perhaps waiting until I was a thousand miles away. I left them alone, saying that I would not give a divorce. As I left, I doubted my own cruelty. On reflection, I realized that if Monica had asked me for a divorce because she fell in love with someone else, I would not have liked it, but I would have accepted the reality of the situation. I couldn't understand why she decided to end our marriage, and although I might have questioned what led to her decision, I decided to let her go. However, her audacity to appear in front of me at home with her lover, hand in hand, presenting divorce papers, was too bold to ignore. Waiting for the cooked dinner on my return, I was puzzled. Thinking about it during dinner at an elite restaurant, I couldn't understand how she could marry me if she was in love with her boss, as I clearly saw today. After finishing my meal, I called Janet, her sister, and informed her that I had left them tied up in the bedroom of our apartment. I deliberately did not specify my location, hoping that they would think that I was leaving the city, although in fact I planned to move within the same city. I registered at Blossom House, notified my boss about the situation, and he agreed to give me a couple of days off. I asked him to let Monica know if she called that I had abruptly quit, citing unspecified reasons related to Florida. Realizing the potential risk of being noticed in the city, I justified my decision with the tactics of temporary postponement. When I visited the bank the next morning, I discovered Monica's deception. The day before, she had withdrawn half of our current and savings accounts. After checking the safe deposit box, I found valuable jewelry that belonged to her family. Taking the opportunity, I took the jewelry away before she realized it was missing, planning to return it to Janet later. The next morning, I rented an SUV and arrived at the apartment when Monica was not at home. Although my key didn't work, I had legal access rights because my name was on the lease. I packed my things in 45 minutes and put them in storage. I canceled our joint credit cards, contacted the property management company behind the damaged door, and shared the whole story with Joan, the company's contact person. While at the library, I developed a plan to lay low, work during the day, and read in my free time. My intention was to disappear temporarily, allowing the situation to cool down and regain control of my life. Even if I rarely go outdoors, there's a small chance that Monica will notice me. I couldn't afford a long stay at the motel, 
so I turned to Joan, who directed me to an apartment complex on the opposite side of town. Joan helped to contact the apartment manager. Staying in the city was risky, especially given Monica's connections, especially with William, who was a reputable lawyer. I bet William wouldn't risk a scandal by pressing assault charges against me for fear of repercussions at his law firm. He would not want the negative publicity associated with his relationship with a married employee. Within three days, I settled into my new apartment. When I came to work, my boss informed me that Monica had called and he informed me about my move to Florida. Her reaction was a simple exclamation of disappointment before hanging up the phone. When I heard that, I couldn't help but laugh. Around 10 one, I called Joan to settle all outstanding payments for the apartment. To my surprise, Monica took care of it. When Joan asked about our plans, I shared my plan for Monica. Joan laughed, calling me evil, and invited me to dinner at her house, ensuring that Monica would not have the slightest chance to see me. We agreed on six ah. Uh, on the way to Joan's, I was thinking about our story. In high school, we dated from time to time, and it almost turned into a serious relationship. Unfortunately, her family moved because of her father's promotion and we lost touch. I only found out that she had returned to the city when I signed the lease. I arrived at Joan's apartment on time, and when she finished cooking dinner, we talked about life. She talked about her journey to Colorado after her father's promotion and her desire to return someday. Unfortunately, the accidental death of her father brought her back and she needed my support. We had a good time and I offered in return to have dinner at my house the next evening, to which she gladly agreed. The next night, Joan and I were having dinner, and while watching the movie, I realized that we were holding hands. The moment was blurry, and I found her looking at me. She talked about a hypothetical scenario of what might have happened between us if her father hadn't moved to Colorado. Intrigued, I offered to find out as soon as I got rid of Monica. Joan doubted the need to wait, but I argued that it would happen as soon as I was done with Monica. I'm still bound by marriage vows and all that. Although she broke her vows and seemingly freed me, but this is far from the case. After all, only when the official divorce papers are filed, signed, and sent back will I consider myself released from my vows. However, it would not be an easy process. I had sincere feelings for her, and I believed that she loved me. Unlike some who can easily turn off love, it will take me some time to recover from Monica. I still have eight years that I thought were good years that need to be buried, and it's going to be a challenge. The first step, I believe, is to settle all legal issues. The paperwork has already been done, so all that remains is to make sure that all my requirements are met. Going to the office where she works seems to be the easiest way, although I'm not thrilled about it, although I'm looking forward to the freedom it will bring me. There's no need to rush. We need to get to know each other again with Joan. It's been 12 years since we broke up, and now we're different people. This is an important point considering that I was head over heels in love with Monica, and our marriage seemed fine until she stunned me with her affair with her boss. The night before the betrayal, we made love three times, and she did it deliberately, which further complicates the situation. But enough of this. I decided not to hide from Monica. Let her find me. So, what would you like to do on our first date? The plan depends on the time, dinner and dancing if it's the weekend, or dinner and going to the cinema if it's the middle of the week. How about dinner and going to the cinema on Wednesday and dinner and dancing on Saturday? I suggest it. It sounds great, but what about Friday? She's asking. Let's solve this now, I suggest, referring to dinner at my house on Friday. She asks if it's too much for me to put myself through such an ordeal in such a short period of time, and I reply that if everything goes well, I'll gladly take up all her time. We're supposed to meet at my place on Friday. My date with Joan on Wednesday goes well, and I get a nice kiss when I drive her home at the end of the evening. Since I've changed my mind about hiding from Monica, I show up at the bowling alley on Thursday. Coincidentally, my team is playing against a team that includes Monica's colleague, Nicole. I ask about the duration of Monica's affair with her boss, and Nicole seems to know but denies any knowledge. However, she eventually reveals the truth, admitting that it lasted about eight months. Nicole reveals that Monica wants to get a divorce in order to marry her boss, and adds that everyone thinks she's making a mistake. 
She asks if I kicked him with a crutch, and I just smile without answering. When I am asked if I will fight a divorce, I answer in the negative, explaining that I will not fight to keep someone who does not want me. Nicole wonders if she has a chance when I go looking for her again, and I tell her I'll keep her in mind, but it takes time. She expresses interest in collaborating with Monica if we meet, thinking it would be fun to watch Monica being torn apart. I share her feelings and hope that Monica will soon realize her mistake by going to someone like her boss. I really enjoyed the evening, especially considering that the team won two out of three games and I hit the jackpot with a score of 228 in the second game. To top it all off, a wonderful man showed genuine interest in me during my Friday date with Joan. However, Saturday took a different turn. After dinner at Duke's Steakhouse, we went to Buckskins to dance. There was a band playing at Buckskins, a country western venue, on weekends, and that night it was Carlos Washington. While dancing with Joan, I noticed Janet Myers, Monica's sister, who came in with her boyfriend and another guy I didn't know. They took a table next to ours but were shocked when Monica joined them. I decided not to hide my presence in the city, but the proximity of their table to mine raised questions. Where was David? Has Monica left him yet? I assumed that the unknown guy was her date for the evening. I warned Joan about a possible awkward meeting, and she laughed it off, looking forward to an unforgettable evening. When the band took a break, I decided to pay the bill and leave. The next song was a waltz, and Janet and the others got up to dance. Monica saw me when they went out on the dance floor, and I noticed the shock on her face. She didn't turn around, seemingly oblivious to my presence. I decided to leave, and Joan and I walked out without any confrontation. Monica confronted me later, asking about Joan and sarcastically calling her my friend. Joan responded humorously mentioning that she had only dated men who had been abandoned by stupid wives. The confrontation escalated, and Monica questioned my presence in the city and my work. Joan intervened, suggesting Monica leave us alone, and tensions escalated. Monica eventually returned to her seat. Joan and I enjoyed the rest of the evening, but the next day I called Janet to discuss something unrelated to Monica. We agreed to meet at Bud's after work. To handle the situation delicately, I planned to give Janet a jewelry box and then leave. I didn't want to involve her in the complexities of Monica's relationship drama. Janet walked in, spotted me, and joined me at the table. Knowing her usual drink, I had it ready for her. She sat up, noticed the drink, took a sip, and asked, Okay, Bob, what's the matter? I placed a box on the table, urging her to open it. She took another sip and revealed a diamond necklace. Recognizing it, she inquired, Where did you find this? I explained and mentioned her rightful claim to it, emphasizing she could keep it all for herself or share it with her sister. Janet appreciated the gesture, and after putting the necklace back, she expressed her gratitude, telling me to stay in touch before leaving. The following day, Monica confronted me at work, demanding her jewelry. I admitted to pawning them and explained my reasons including sparing her family heirlooms and covering the money she withdrew from our accounts. Monica accused me of lying and claimed I took more than half, revealing the value of the jewelry exceeded $80,000. I stood my ground, explaining I pawned them to offset her withdrawals. She threatened to involve the police, but I countered with a pawn shop receipt, giving her an option to buy back the items. As Monica threatened legal action, I warned her against escalating the situation. She left, vowing it wasn't the end. The next day, a man handed me legal papers indicating I had been served. The contents mirrored Monica's accusations, aligning with what she had intended during the previous confrontation. This turn of events confirmed my expectations, and I braced myself for the legal battle that lay ahead. I didn't request alimony. Instead, I swiftly signed the divorce papers, sealed them in an envelope, and dropped them off in the outgoing mail tray on Sally's desk. When Sally asked if I was going through a divorce, I confirmed it and expressed my readiness to explore new connections. This sudden interest from women like Joan, Nicole, and now Sally provided a boost to my wounded ego. I even called Joan, informing her of the divorce and considering myself released from my vows. Joan, excited about the news, 
invited me over for a celebration dinner, and we agreed it was a date. One evening, as I was having dinner and watching TV at home, Janet called, accusing me of being an evil man. She shared how she had spent the last half hour consoling her sister, who cried over what I supposedly did to her jewelry. Janet mentioned that Monica had asked John for $30,000 to redeem a pawned item, but he couldn't provide it until the next quarterly bonus, leaving Monica in tears. Taking pity, I revealed I had the money and offered to help, keeping the necklace for myself. Janet expressed her gratitude and I remembered Joan's advice to keep in touch. Whether I pursued such actions was largely influenced by Joan. While we had a connection at school, the extent of our involvement was unclear. When I visited Joan, she greeted me in a revealing dress and set a romantic scene with candles, wine, and dinner. Joan proposed a toast to new beginnings, and after a delightful dinner, she hinted at a romantic evening ahead. In the bedroom, Joan shared her desires, and that night marked the beginning of our practically becoming a couple. However, due to the technicality of my marriage status, there were some limitations to our relationship. Despite this, Joan and I encountered Monica a few times, with Monica keeping her distance but displaying a slightly hostile expression. A week after my divorce was finalized, I knelt in front of Joan and proposed to her. Engaged in building a cradle for the twins on the way, I was interrupted when my ex-wife entered the basement, announcing the arrival of someone. I promptly put away my tools, cleaned up, and joined her. After that, I went upstairs for dinner with my father-in-law. As I entered the living room, he was seated on the sofa, and his wife had already brought him a drink. My sweetheart joined us, brought me a beer, sat on my lap, and sipped her margarita as we talked. The conversation revolved around the impending arrival of twins, discussing whether we had chosen names and why we were adamant about not knowing their gender before birth. As always, the elephant in the room surfaced, and this time my father-in-law brought it up. He inquired if I had heard anything about my sister lately, and I admitted I hadn't. He expressed curiosity about the situation, but I wasn't inclined to investigate. All I knew was what my sister had told me during her last call. She left her husband due to constant infidelity, and they were heading for divorce. Roy had always predicted one of them would cheat within a year of marriage. I shrugged, stroked my sweetheart's baby bump, and declared that it didn't matter to me because I won. I was holding her. My father-in-law shook his head, and I got more beer bought for me at the lodge because of the unique situation with both daughters marrying me. He marveled at being the only father in the state with such a son-in-law. When he couldn't comprehend the transition from Monica to Janet, I explained that when I proposed to Joan, she said no. I accepted it and realized I had done all I could with Joan. Over the next two months, I occasionally visited a bar with dance music, and one evening at the Stagecoach Inn, I encountered Janet Myers. Janet approached and asked why I hadn't called. I reminded her of my clear intentions to pursue her before Monica, she questioned the feasibility of us being together while maintaining a decent relationship with her sister and father. I asserted that Monica had missed her chance and her father could either be happy for me or not. Janet suggested we start our courtship with a dance and I accepted. Monica wasn't pleased and Janet didn't mince words with her. Surprisingly, her father expressed happiness about keeping me in the family. Six months after meeting at the Stagecoach Inn, I proposed to Janet during a Sunday dinner at her father's house. She said yes, and three months later, we were married. Eight months into our marriage, I learned I was going to be a father. And three months after that, we discovered it was twins. Despite the challenges, I remained happy. As for my ex, her boss dumped her, which was to be expected. She was left with heavy debts. Of course, everyone helps her as much as they can, but everyone also understands that she is to blame for this. As for me, I am happy, I have beautiful twins, and I am ready to move on. How do you like the story? Write your opinion in the comments. Tell us what you would do if, God forbid, you found yourself in a similar situation. I believe that the man did the right thing. The main thing is to be happy, and people who betray must bear their punishment.